All right, turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 10. We're going to be in two passages today, so if you can find 2 Corinthians 10 and Psalm 23, we'll start in 2 Corinthians 10 and then get into Psalm 23. If you don't have your Bible handy, they will be up on the screen. And while you're finding those, let me pray for us again. Father, again, we thank you that you've gathered us together here as your people and as your church this morning. We love to be in your presence. And now, Lord, we long to be transformed by your word. So speak to us, Lord, through these passages. They're both familiar, especially Psalm 23. But help us to see something new in Psalm 23, how you made that a weapon for us in our spiritual warfare toolbox. So let's speak to us. And as always, we invite the power of the Holy Spirit to be present with us. Because we know that as the Holy Spirit is with us, there can be no spirit of distraction in the room. And as the Holy Spirit is with us, there can be no spirit of doubt or confusion in the room. Only the Holy Spirit may speak and move, and we long for you to do just that, Spirit. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, last week I started talking about the war in our mind, when those thoughts and the things going on in our mind just seem to be taking control, and how do we deal with that? As Amy mentioned during worship, this is Pentecost Sunday. I'm not preaching on Pentecost Sunday because, or on Pentecost because Paulson did that just a few weeks ago, and he did a very, very good job. Uh, I don't see him this morning, but Paulson did a great job talking about Pentecost a few Sundays ago, so I'm going to give part two to that message last week, the war in our mind. How to take control and win the battle with the voices and thoughts in our head. Last week we saw how the weapons that we are to fight with are not the weapons of this world, right? And we're going to review that in just a second. Today we're going to look at how we can use scripture as one of our weapons. If the weapons are not the weapons of the world, then what are our weapons? Well, scripture is one, and I'm going to show you a very specific way to do that today using Psalm 23. I want to start by just rereading the passage that we looked at last week in 2 Corinthians 10, and then we'll jump into Psalm 23. So Stephen, yeah, go ahead and put up 2 Corinthians 10. By the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you, I, Paul, who am timid when face to face with you, but bold when away, I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect to be towards some people who think that we live by the standards of this world. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So that was the, where we spent most of our time last week. And the one thing that I pointed out was Paul recognized this as spiritual warfare and not just a disagreement. So there were people in the church at Corinth, they were saying, well, when you write letters to us, you're real bold. But when you're here, you seem real timid. And he could have been offended by that. And he could have just had a disagreement with them. But he saw it for what it was. It was spiritual warfare. It was an attack from the devil himself. Something we need to learn and remember. We get all bent out of shape and get offended by stuff, and it was spiritual warfare. So as we continue to look through, I'm going to re summarize here real quickly. One of the first lessons that we saw last week is that we have to use the right kind of weapons. In order to fight spiritual battles, we need spiritual weapons. I had joked that I'd love to punch the devil in the face, but it doesn't work that way. We need spiritual weapons. Second, these lies or thoughts that, we've been, that are coming into our mind have been lifted up against us. They have been lifted up in place of Jesus. I even pointed out last week how the verb here, the lifted up verb, is in the passive form in the Greek, which means that it's lifted up against our will. So when those thoughts come in your head, it's because the devil is putting something up against you, against your will. Then the third thing we saw is that these thoughts that are lifted up in our minds are lifted up in contrast to the knowledge of God. They're presenting themselves as false knowledge, but remember, the devil masquerades as an angel of light, so when these thoughts are lifted up against us, it seems real. And fourth thing we saw in this passage is that we must take all of our thoughts captive. Paul doesn't say, take some of your thoughts captive. He says, take all of your thoughts captive. Because if you leave some of those thoughts wandering around in your mind, it becomes a slippery slope. And then some of those thoughts start to get rooted in your mind, and before long, you've lost control of your mind. 
Today I want to come back to this idea that these lies that are being lifted up against us are being lifted in contrast to the knowledge of God. And we are to fight back with the weapons, not, not with the weapons of the world, but with the knowledge of God that is Scripture. Remember from last week, we are to take the, cap, take the thought captive, grab hold of it. Today I want to show you how we're going to use Scripture to force that thought to come back into obedience with the knowledge of God. So you have a thought in your head, you take it captive, you grab hold of it, and now you're going to speak Scripture to it. To make, remember, we're, it says we're supposed to make it obedient to Christ. So by using Scripture, we're going to make that thought in our mind become obedient to Christ. Because remember, the thought is being lifted up against us without our will and in violation of the knowledge of God. Now, I've chosen to demonstrate this to you with Psalm 23 because Psalm 23 is so well known and so well and so easy to memorize. Many people have at least parts of Psalm 23 memorized, and that's key because when the thoughts come in your head, you need those tools in your toolbox quickly. You can't be like, oh, wait, wait, I need a verse for this thought. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? If you've got something like Psalm 23 already memorized, the tool's already in your toolbox. I also chose Psalm 23 because it speaks of the nature and the character of God. When the devil lies to us, we can use Psalm 23 because it is the truth of who God is. Remember, he's lifting up false knowledge. So what I need is absolute truth, and that is the statements of Psalm 23 about who God is. And Psalm 23, you know, we only think of Psalm 23 at funerals, right? Which is really a shame because it's not intended for that at all. And I'll point that out in a minute. Psalm 23 is a prophetic statement of Jesus. Read Psalm 23 with Jesus in mind in every verse. It's who Jesus is. All right, so let's go to Psalm 23. Stephen, pop that one up there. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death or the darkest valley, some translations have. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Do you see that that's Jesus? I want to go through it phrase by phrase and show you how to use it as a spiritual weapon. The first phrase, the Lord is my shepherd. Well, what's the job of the shepherd? To provide care, to protect, to look out for, right? So when those thoughts are coming against you, when you're thinking, I feel alone, I feel unprotected, I feel uncared for, is God enough? When that's the lie in your head, take the thought captive and respond with what is true. The Lord is my shepherd. Shut the devil up. Just say, the Lord is my shepherd. Say it out loud if you have to. There's a funny story about it I'll share real quick. I was mentoring a woman in our church once. She was really struggling with those thoughts in her head. And I was kind of teaching her this whole concept about how to take the thoughts captive and speak to it. She was at work one day and she was struggling with the thoughts in her head. She remembered what I had told her. She goes, all right, I'm going to speak against it now. I'm going to do what the pastor says. I'm going to speak out loud. The words that she chose to use in that moment were, Satan, get behind me. And she said it out loud. What she didn't realize is there was a co-worker standing behind her. And the co-worker went, what did you just say to me? I encourage you to speak it out loud, but be careful who's standing around you. You might end up in the loony bin. You might end up in the loony bin, yeah. Or worse. But take the thought captive. Speak, the Lord is my shepherd. And believe all of the truth behind that statement. The Lord is our shepherd. He is not a hired hand kind of shepherd. He is the perfect shepherd. So you can say that the Lord is my shepherd. Stand on the faith and the truth of what that means about God. Shut that voice in your head up. The next phrase, I shall not be in want. Because the Lord is our shepherd, he will not let us be in want. That's the shepherd's job is to provide for. So when the thoughts come in your mind that you are in need, that you're not going to have enough, that you're going to end up starving and homeless, 
take the thought captive and speak to that lie, I shall not be in want. Declare it and believe it. This is not health and wealth thinking or preaching. This is believing and declaring the promises of God, his character and his nature. He promises that we will not be in want. So when the devil tries to tell you that you're going to have need, just speak it. I shall not be in want. The Lord is my shepherd. Now, there may be a difference between our wants and what God wants for us. You might want a big screen TV more than God wants you to have that big screen TV. But God has promised to provide the basics for our life. Jesus also drives home this point in Matthew 6, 26 and 27, where he says, look, even the birds of the field, I take care of them. How much more will I take care of you? Here's the thing. When we speak the promises of God like this, we not only break the stronghold of the lie, but we also speak the promise into the spiritual atmosphere around us. And then at that point, God can be begin to move on it. But if we are speaking and believing the lie, God can't move on that, but the enemy sure can. So if, the enemy, if that thought comes into your head and you start to believe it or you start to speak it, God can't move on that. But the devil will move right in and bring all of his friends and furniture. But when I speak the promises of God, when I say something like, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. Now God can move into that with the fullness of all of his promises. Again, it's not health and wealth. It's just speaking the truth of who God is. Verse 2. He makes me lie down in green pastures, which reminds us of I shall not be in want. A good shepherd leads their sheep to fields of good, abundant green grass, not muddy, worn out pastures. As soon as that pasture gets a little too trampled, the shepherd will move them on to a new area where the grass is green and fresh. This again speaks of God's promises to care for us and provide for us. But I love this part. It says, he makes me. The Hebrew word verb used here refers to making an animal lie down. It's an agricultural technical term used only here in all of the Old Testament. The good shepherd will not only lead us to green pastures, but he will make us lie down and rest. Which means he can provide for us without us having to strive for it. Isn't that good news? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want and I don't have to strive. He will make me lie down in green pastures. You can't not be blessed by him. So if you're feeling attacked by busyness and striving and the stress of lack, declare it. He makes me lie down in green pastures. This is not an excuse for laziness, but an invitation to trust God's brand of provision in the face of the lies in your head. He lays me beside quiet waters. Water is, of course, essential to life. Part of the shepherd's job is to lead the sheep to clean water. But here, water also represents refreshment in the Old Testament covenant system here. Because the Lord is our shepherd, he will provide the basics of life, but he will also bring refreshment and stillness. These are not troubled waters. These are quiet waters. If the lies or lack of provision, stress, feeling drained, even if the trouble is all just in your head, take the thought captive and declare, he leads me beside still waters. And then let him lead you. Right? In order to be led beside still waters, you have to be leadable. I think I just made up a word. Chill out. All right, we're all good. Verse 3. Starts with, he restores my soul. Here we see more clearly that we're not just talking about a literal shepherd. We're talking about Jesus. Because Jesus is in the business of restoring souls. No matter what we have done in the past, no matter how we have been slimed by life or the things that others have done to us, Jesus restores our soul. So when the enemy plants lies in your head that you're tainted or no good, just speak this. Jesus restores my soul. Shut up, devil. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. When you're feeling tempted, when temptation is the trouble in your mind... Remind the devil that Jesus leads us in paths of righteousness. For his name's sake, he can't not do it. His integrity is at stake. For the sake and the name of Jesus, he will lead you into righteousness. And when you're feeling tempted, speak to that thought. 
I will be led into righteousness by Jesus. And then let him lead you, of course. Verse 4. This is sadly why it's only ever read at funerals. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. This doesn't refer to actual death, but it's shadow. The word literally means death shadow. The YLT translation renders it well with, when I walk, when I walk in a valley of death shade. Modern scholars are more convinced that this was referring to a physical location in Palestine where there is a valley that no matter what time of day it is, the sun never gets into that valley. It's always dark in there. And that valley was referred to as death valley or death shade. So it has nothing to do with funerals, and we should really go to Psalm 23 more than just funerals. But certainly what the writer is getting at here is also a dark time or a dark season in our life. Now, the darkness of the shadow does not mean that, the, that there is an absence of God's presence. When a mother hen gathers her chicks under her wings, it's dark in there. When I'm going through a very dark time, even when it feels like death is crouching at the door, I don't have to fear the attacks of the enemy. I don't have to give in to fear. No matter how dark it is around you or how dark the thoughts in your head, declare, I will fear no evil. The enemy tries to get, get us to live from a place of fear, but the good shepherd has a different plan. I believe that Christians should be immune to all fear. I get a kick out of it when people try to intimidate me using fear, and I'm like, I'm fear proof. Ain't going to work. Then it says, for you are with me. Jesus is always with us. He will never leave us or forsake us, right? In that dark place, in those dark thoughts, speak it out. Jesus is with me. And it is because he is with us that we never need to fear evil. Jesus' presence is always greater than the evil. Now, we may have to keep saying this until the enemy believes you believe it, but just keep saying it. You know how dogs can smell fear? So can the devil. He will keep tormenting you until he believes that you no longer fear him. Mm -hmm. like turning on a light. It's like turning on a light. The cockroaches run. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The rod and the staff are tools of the shepherd. Tools for both safety and rescue. To a staff to pull them from danger, as well as correction and discipline. The rod for a little nudge or a whack. But sometimes the enemy will come and speak to you. You had to be rescued again. You had to be disciplined or corrected by the Lord again. But when we find comfort in the rescue and the discipline of the Lord, we can speak these very words back to the enemy as a promise. This is a comfort to me. This is a sign of the Lord's love and care for me that he had to use his rod and his staff upon me. It's a promise from God. So don't let the enemy beat you down that God used it. Declare the love and the care of the shepherd in it. This is a promise fulfilled. Verse 5. This is perhaps my favorite verse in here. You prepare a table before me in the five-star Hilton. No? What does it say? Wait, he didn't get rid of the enemies? You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. The Lord will not only bless us with great provision... The language here we have to understand speaks of a banquet table. The word in the Hebrew is a banquet table. It's not a coffee table. It's not an end table. It's a banquet table. But he will do it right in front of the enemy. The implication is God will not remove the enemy so that he proves his goodness to us and the enemy. He will serve us the banquet under the nose of Satan like ha. So we have to learn to be okay with receiving our provision and blessing with the enemy staring us down. We will eat in the face of the enemy as a sign of God's protection and care. Here's the best part. The enemy can't touch what's on your table unless we let him. 
Now the enemy is going to be breathing down your neck and staring at you while you're eating, but he can't touch it because that was for you. The table has been prepared for each one of us. Jesus told us that the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. So when the enemy whispers in our ear that he is going to steal our provision, we can simply reply with, don't touch my stuff. <laughs> You can't touch my stuff. That banquet, that provision was prepared for me to prove God's goodness. So often we turn our attention to the enemy and even try to make peace with him. And while we're trying to make peace with him, he steals our provision and peace. Do you see that? When the enemy stares at us, keep your eyes on Jesus and keep eating. We have to learn to be okay with receiving our provision and blessing with the enemy staring us down. The verse goes on to say, you anoint my head with oil. To anoint with oil here isn't the normal word for anointing. It's the he this Hebrew word for anointing is sensual rather than sacramental. It means to make luxuriant. The Lord's provision can be luxuriant from a place of love and care. When the enemy makes you feel less than, when he tries to diminish your worth, declare he anoints my head with oil, only the best for me. Do you see that? The anointing with oil was something that they used to do, a shepherd would do to the sheep. They would anoint the sheep's head with oil to keep the bugs out of the sheep's ears. And people often believe that's what this referred to. But this word in Hebrew refers to making luxuriant. God's blessings for you are extravagant. And again, that's not health and wealth monkey business. That's just the character and nature of who God is. Do you believe it? Then it goes on to my cup overflows. The cup, of course, refers to a wine cup. A cup overflowing with wine speaks of an abundant harvest. But all of this speaks of the love, care, provision, abundance of a good life. And not just in the material, in the spirit realm, in our minds. My cup overflows can speak of a mind that overflows with good thoughts. Right? You see, God can't have a negative thought. He can't. Everything he created and everything is in his control. So he can't have a negative thought. So he doesn't wake up one day and be like, whoa, that Pastor Tim guy, how'd he sneak by me? Huh. <laughs> doesn't work that way. So when our cup is overflowing with the goodness of the Lord, our thoughts are overflowing with the same goodness that he has. I cannot afford to have a thought about myself that is not true of how God thinks about me. And God can't have a negative thought. Yeah. Verse 6. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. All the days of the life here refers to this life. He's talking about now, not the future, not heaven, this life now. All of the goodness of God will follow me now. Now the word goodness here in the Hebrew is an interesting word. It can't be translated into English uh, using just one word. It's the, it's the Hebrew verb hasid. You kind of have to Hack up a little something to say that. But it's often, it's often translated with loving kindness. Here they use goodness and love. But it's a Hebrew concept and covenant that we can't just get with one word. Loving kindness, loving goodness, something like that. But this loving kindness will pursue us or chase us all of our life. When the enemy speaks otherwise, just speak it. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, devil. Shut up. But there's something else going on that I really want you to see. In this verse, it says, Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. Follow me is way too passive. This is more like hunt me down. The word in Hebrew means to pursue, to chase, to persecute, to hunt, and put to flight. The hesed of God will hunt me down. Stephen, put up that graphic that's in there, please. In the Hebrew of Psalm 23, goodness and mercy do not follow us all the days of our life. That translation is far too bloodless for the, for the verb radaf. 
It means chase after or pursue. The goodness and mercy of God don't follow us like a good little puppy dog. They gallop after us like celestial stallion. They chase us down labyrinthian paths like hounds of heaven. They stay hot on our heels. The goodness and mercy of our shepherd redoff us all the way to heaven's gates and into the arms of our Father. Ooh. Yeah. yeah. Like Woohoo. That's That's Isn't that amazing? So when the, enemy, when the enemy torments you with those negative thoughts, remind him that the goodness of God is hunting you down. And even if you're just feeling like a little down, a little like less than full, God's goodness is hunting you down. Re remember that. Remember that. I'll send that out in the Monday email so you've got that. And then it ends with, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This speaks of being in his presence. Even more so now that we have the Holy Spirit than when this was written in ancient Hebrew times. But when the enemy tells us that we are separated from God, that God is far off or distant, he's not going to take care of us, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Just speak it. It's a promise. <clears throat> now that's just one passage of scripture. You can do this with others. I'm going to give you a few other real quick examples as I wrap up. If the lies and, and the thoughts that are going on in your head say, God is not going to come through for me, remember Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purposes. If that thought in your head is, life is just too much, where is God? Romans 8, 37, 39. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That'll shut the devil up. Or if that verse, that thought in your head, you don't deserve to be saved. Ephesians 2.8, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself, it is a gift from God. We don't do anything to earn our salvation, it's all from Jesus. But sometimes we have to remind those thoughts of that. Whatever situation you are facing, there is a scripture for it. God is good like that. I have never seen this not work. I've only seen people being willing to not do it. I often encourage, I did this last Sunday, I often encourage people to get a notebook, a two-sided notebook. And when you have all those thoughts going on in your head, write the negative thought on this side of the notebook and then find the scriptures that refute it and write them on this side of the notebook. And the voices will stop. I guarantee it. If you're willing to do it, I guarantee it will work. It's a promise from God. His word is sharper than any double-edged sword. His word will stop all of those thoughts from the enemy. Now, the battle won't be easy. There's never been a war that was easy. And remember, this is a war. We just have to use the right weapons. We have to use spiritual weapons. A soldier never ignores his weapons and then hopes that when he needs them, they will work. So we must be attending to our spiritual weapons all the time. Think about a soldier in the military. They're issued a weapon, and that's their weapon. They are constantly cleaning and working on that thing. They take it apart, they clean it, they put it all back together, and they do it constantly. They even, the military will even force them to do it in the dark. They'll make it pitch dark, pitch dark. Take it apart, your weapon, clean it, put it back together. Because out on the battlefield, you might not always have light. So that they know when they need that weapon, it's going to be there, and it's going to work, and they're going to know how to use it, clean it, and fix it. This is a war. Why don't we use the same methods and principles? This is our weapon. We need to have the weapons at our disposal that we need to shut down the voices in our head. Learn the verses. Memorize Psalm 23. Memorize some of these other verses. Have them in your toolbox so that you can apply them immediately. Because if that thought comes and you've got to go hunting for your weapon, it's too late. That thought will put down roots in your mind and then it's too late. This is also not the power of positive thinking. This is agreeing with the promises of God. This is understanding what is the knowledge of God for us. This is understanding what is the character and the nature of God. You see, when the enemy comes to attack us, he always attacks the character and nature of God. And I see people fall for this all the time. I'm like, 
But that's not God. That's not what God, that's not what God said. That's not who he is. We must understand his character and his nature as part of our defense against this. And you will have to do this more than once until it takes effect. You will have to do this until you convince the enemy that you believe it and that you're not afraid of him. And remember, when we speak the promises of God like this, we not only bring the stronghold of the lie under the authority, but we allow God to move into that situation because we have spoken his promise. And he is now obligated to move on his promise. Because if he doesn't, he's a liar. And God's not a liar. So again, identify those thoughts and those lies that you're having in your head. Find the scriptures that refute those. Psalm 23 or whatever other scripture you need, and just have those tools available. Sometimes I even encourage people, write those scriptures out on post-it notes and put them everywhere where you'll see them. Put them on your bathroom mirror, your steering wheel, your refrigerator. So you've always got your weapons in front of you. So they're there when you need them. Amen? All right, with that, I'll call the worship team back up.